afternoon, everyone. I have a really boring presentation, so I need more energy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Much better. Thank you. When Richard first asked me to be a speaker here, um, he showed me the lineup of speakers, and it was very, very impressive. He was thinking maybe I'd sort of be more attracted to come and speak here if I saw it, but I was actually very intimidated. I said, Richard, these are all big shots. Where do I belong here? Did somebody back out? You can ask him. I actually asked that. And he said, no, we want to have some sort of young startups on the stage to speak about their experience. I'm already on the stage, so they can't uninvite me, so I'll let you in on a secret. We're actually not that young a startup. In fact, we're probably the oldest startup uh, this whole afternoon and this, this morning. The idea for Medgrocer came about sort of 33 years ago. I hope I don't sort of give up my age. But it came up about 33 years ago. You see, my brother grew up with asthma. Does anyone here have siblings with asthma, parents, or maybe yourself? So there you go, some gentleman in the back. His asthma would strike at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. at night. Uh, and he would be wheezing, and it would sound like he was literally dying. So my dad would hop into his car and then drive around the neighborhood looking for a 24-hour drugstore. If he found a 24-hour drugstore, he'd go in, mission accomplished, he'd ask for the drug, and they'd be out of stock. So he'd go on driving around, and it usually took him maybe an hour, an hour and a half to get back with these drugs. Um, and I'd be keeping my brother company during this hour, hour and a half, and I would joke with him saying, no, you, you might be dying, but I can get you a pizza because it'll come before your meds come. Uh, he didn't laugh, although you guys, some guys there did, but he didn't really laugh because it's kind of sad when you think about it that you can order pizza and, and, and have it delivered to you hot in 45 minutes, but not a life-saving drug. Uh, now it's my father's turn to be buying drugs from him, for himself. He has hypertension, he has diabetes, my joke to him is this because you ordered too many pizzas when you were too young. Uh, but he calls it a pilgrimage and his penance for his past sins. And if you think about it, it really is a bit of penance. You guys look really healthy, and some of you, I think, are from outside of the country. But let me explain to you what the typical drug store process is in the Philippines. So it's a bit like a time machine. You sort of walk into the drug store, it looks the same as it did 30 years ago right? True. 30 plus years ago, it looked pretty much the same. The procedures are the same. Sometimes even the people are unfortunately the same. But in any case, you walk in and there's a sort of line with quotes because it's sort of horizontal and, you know, it's like a random order of picking people. And you give them the prescription if they finally notice you. They take it, they look you up and down, they go back, then they come back to you with the drug. Sometimes it's out of stock, but never mind. You tell them, yes, I want this drug. I want X number of them. They go back, and then after some time, they come back to you with a bill. And then you give them the money, and then guess what happens next? They go back. And then they chat a bit sometimes, and then they, they come to you with your change. So it's like three or four trips. That's why you don't see many fat pharmacists. Uh, our pharmacists, they sort of have constant exercise going back and forth. Um, but you can imagine how painful this is if you're a, a customer, that you're sort of stuck between two people who are really sick and you're more afraid of getting their disease than curing your disease. Uh, and that's sort of the problem. And in the 15 minutes it takes to give you a drug off the shelf, you can think of a restaurant, which was my previous job. I founded a bunch of restaurants. There's about 50 of them right now. In those 15 minutes, our restaurants can sort of cook up a happy meal for you. A happy meal of one main dish, one side dish, iced tea, free soup, unlimited rice. Sorry, Richard told me I shouldn't plug my grocer so much, but he didn't say I couldn't plug my restaurant. Um, so we could actually give you this meal. Uh, in that 15 minutes, and it, again, think about it. It's easier to get a box off a shelf and give it to somebody than to cook up a meal. So that's one of the issues I have. But coming again from the restaurant industry, you know, in restaurants, you walk into a Starbucks or, or, or a Jollibee or a McDonald's, they always greet you. You know this? 
right? They always greet you. They always ask how you are, how can they make you happier today? But when you walk to a typical traditional drugstore, they don't really greet you. They right? just sort of look you up and down uh, and then do their sort of relay game of going back and forth. And they don't even say goodbye. I don't mind that they don't say come again because I don't want to get sick again, but the point is they're not very service-oriented, to be honest, because you need to buy from them. It's not by choice that you're, you're going there. But the fact that they don't greet me is not my biggest problem. The fact that uh, they don't really give a deeper level of service is my bigger issue. Before I go on, I want to know how many medical doctors there are in this room. Can you raise your hands? None, right? Good, I can make jokes about them. Um, <laughs> the typical Filipino uh, community, 56% of the people do not understand their prescription. That's an actual study, 56%. Uh, and I think it really has to do a lot with the handwriting of doctors. And I'm wondering how they passed their grade three penmanship class. I wonder when they were deciding on med school, did they think, oh, I have ugly handwriting, clear career path or I'm wondering if they took up sort of hieroglyphics when they were in med school. Um, my personal belief, though, is it's none of the above. It's more like, you know these generic drug names, these long, long molecules, they're really hard to spell. And the uglier your handwriting, the more difficult it is to detect misspellings. So I think that's sort of the real reason why their handwriting is so ugly. But the problem is not only can the misspellings not be seen, the the, the, the customer, the patient, and sometimes even the pharmacist can't understand it, right? And not only can they not understand it, oftentimes when you get the drug from the pharmacy, and tell me if this is not true, because I want to go to your pharmacy, they don't tell you, take this three times a day. Right. Don't take it on an empty stomach. Don't take it with this particular medicine. They don't give you those instructions. Sort of give it to you and you're on your own. Good luck with that. Right, so, so that's, that's sort of an issue, this lack of, lack of information. Um, all this would be okay with me if drug prices in these drugstores were cheap, right? Sort of high inconvenience, low levels of service. You know, if you give me low price, I'm happy. But the fact of the matter is the Philippine drug prices are about double that of comparable countries. They are very, very expensive here. And there are several reasons for this. One reason of it is labor, which I mentioned. You're paying for people to exercise by going back and forth three or four times. Sometimes you're lucky and there's no line and you go in and sort of 90% of them are not doing anything. The typical pharmacist assistant is actually idle half the time. I use the term pharmacist assistant uh, because to be honest, they're actually not pharmacists. So you don't really want them to give you, you drug information sometimes. These are pharmacist assistants. Half of them are not doing anything. Uh, it's not because they're there not because uh, drugstores want to put normal clerks in. They're there because there's not enough pharmacists in the country. There's 20,000 pharmacies. Philippine law says every pharmacy should have a uh, pharmacist, but there's only 14,000 registered uh, pharmacists. So you do the math, 20,000 last I check is bigger than 14,000. But anyway, these pharmacist assistants sort of are idle half the time and they're doing these trips and it causes lots of labor uh, inefficiency. The second thing is rent. The typical pharmacy is 150 square meters, 100 square meters. They're located in high traffic areas, right? So you pay a lot in rent. I say you pay a lot in rent, not the drugstore because all these higher costs are passed on to us. This labor inefficiency, this high rent. There's a third thing which is sort of passed on to us. 85% of doctors actually prescribe generic medicine. It's by law that they have to do that. So it's on the prescription. But the typical drugstore, 40% nationwide, 30% in Metro Manila. Only 40% nationwide, 30% in Metro Manila actually offer alternatives. Normally, they reflexively give you the biggest brand, the most expensive brand. So there's a lack of consumer choice. They oftentimes say it's out of stock, right? And they just make you buy the, the more expensive one. So clearly, there are problems of inconvenience. There's problems of low levels of service, and there's problems of high prices. And this is 
the Philippine drug problem. That sounds a bit wrong. No, it's not that drug problem. Uh, it's the other drug problem. But there are similarities. There are similarities because people are dying because of this drug problem. Right? High prices in accessible medicine kills people. 70% of Filipinos are not adherent to their drug regimen. If you think about it, if 56% don't understand their prescription, it's just adding a little number to that. So 70% don't, under, don't uh, follow their drug regimen. And this has real costs. And I hear lots of sad stories when I went around talking to people. I hear about stories of people splitting pills. You know people who split pills, right, to save costs. Right, so they, don't, they take half the dose. You hear of people missing entire weeks of dose because they had to spend their money for something else and they're working, waiting for payday. The worst stories I heard were, pe are, are people who are forced to commit some sort of shady stuff for their drug problem. Again, different drug problem. But anyway, I heard stories of people trying to get admitted into hospitals with chest pains or headaches or some random disease because in hospitals they actually give you drugs for the rest of the week and it's paid for by somebody, right? Not by that person, but by somebody, be it insurance or your company or, or PhilHealth. At the end of the day, it increases costs for the system. It's very inefficient. Uh, people who are non-adherent to their drug regimen are 2.5 to 5 times more likely to be hospitalized or to have something fatal happen to them. It's not about just costs, it's about people dying because of this drug problem. So, med grocers on online pharmacy. <clears throat> what are we doing to address these issues of high inconvenience, low levels of service, and high costs? So, the way we've sort of solved it is offering people convenience, um, service, and, and, and lower costs. That's sort of obvious, but it's a bit more complex than that. What we've done is we've built a drug delivery system on an online, digitally enabled platform. This allows us to wring out inefficiencies from the cost structure of delivering drugs. When you think about it, you know, our drug costs here are double that in Thailand or Malaysia, and it's not because the drug is more expensive. It's pretty much the same molecule. The problem is the difficulty of delivering it. For example, the most uh, common drug for diabetes costs 50 cents and is sold for two pesos and 50 cents. And the reason why there's such a big markup is not for the drug, it's to pay for all this inefficiency in the system. And by going digital, we've been able to really streamline the system. We've re-engineered the drug buying process. We've removed unneeded, inefficient infrastructure and processes from the drug buying process. Let me tell you how we've done that. The first thing we did was make it more convenient for people. A lot of the cost of drugs is actually in the travel time, paying for the transportation to go to the drugstore and come back. Sometimes it's, you know, you're just sick and you're supposed to stay in bed. You know, get some bed rest, but go to the drugstore and get this drug. It's like that can't be done. So there's a problem of convenience. A while ago, I talked to you a bit about being able to serve a happy meal in 15 minutes. In 90 minutes, we can actually deliver to your home a happy meal, which includes a um, main dish, one side, no soup, no iced tea, no unlimited rice. I really love the mileage I'm getting here for pushing my restaurant. Um, but the fact is, it's not that hard to deliver a box compared to delivering a whole meal. So we're making that happen, right? Delivering a box to your doorstep. So you don't have to go out when you're sick. If you have a sore foot and you can't get out, we'll get you the drugs there. So we're offering convenience and we're making it easy for people to order. It shouldn't be that hard to order drugs. You can upload the, the prescription, you can email it to us, you can just tell us if you know what the drug is and how to spell it. And if you don't know how to spell it, we'll sort of figure it out for you. But we've also made the ordering process online or digital, and it can be done anytime, anywhere, and we'll get, get them to you. It's also paperless, and I'll refer to this more later on, the, the fact that it's paperless. 
The second thing we've done is created a layer of service around this. Since it's digital, since it's delivery, we can actually use a very centralized infrastructure. All the pharmacists in one place. We're the only drugstore in the whole Philippines, not even the leading drugstores can claim this, where every single order is received by a pharmacist and is actually signed by a pharmacist before it goes out. We have people sign every package of drugs that go out in order to make sure that these people swear that if counseling is needed by that patient for their drug, they actually get that counseling. So the patient gets the information. On our end, we have information on who sent out the drug. So if it ends up in the wrong hands or the wrong drugs come out, we know exactly who to fire. But never mind about that. Uh, we also remind people about drugs. We have patients who have Alzheimer's and they forget their drugs or forget to replenish. You know, so we remind them, do you want us to pick or deliver your drugs again? And you know, if they say yes, we just give it to them and they, they, they pay for it or the company pays for it. So that solves a bit of the problem of convenience. It solves a bit of the problem of service. The third problem we have is cost, and you know, I'm Chinese, so this is really important to me. Uh, we try to lower costs, because I'm Chinese, and I like to sell stuff really cheap. <laughs> I'm kidding, but not really. So the way we sell stuff cheap is by squeezing out inefficiencies from the system, right? I mentioned a while ago the problem of labor where half the time the pharmacist assistants or pharmacists are not doing anything, the other half of the time they're, they're exercising by going back and forth. Our pharmacists are busy all the time because they continuously process orders. Instead of taking three trips for one order, they can take one trip to do three orders. This makes them much faster. It also makes them fatter, but you know, Never mind about that. They get free drugs anyway for that. So they're much more uh, efficient than the typical drugstore because everything is sort of channeled through. It's paperless. They record everything. It's all very done very neatly and cleanly. The second thing is rent. We don't need to be in a highly visible area. It's more like a warehouse type space. The second thing is it can operate in a much smaller space. We don't need space for these lines and overflow of customers. Uh, it's just much more efficient. And we don't have to stock that many drugs. So even our storage space is much smaller. It's a fraction of what the typical drugstore needs. So we've been able to squeeze out a lot of costs. The third thing we do is give people choice. A while ago I mentioned that you know, in a typical drugstore, they'll give you the most expensive thing at once. And sometimes that's necessary, and that's okay. What's not okay is not even having cheaper alternatives available. <coughs> and that's what we do, because we're online, because we deliver, so we have a window of op opportunity to stock up if you don't have something. We offer people choice of drugs. You know, the most expensive drug, which their doctors insist on, or uh, there's no other alternative, a secondary drug, a tertiary drug. We have multiple choices, and this is very, very important to people. So that's how we've solved the convenience issue, the service issue, and the cost issue. And we're constantly evolving because we don't have legacy issues, because we don't have the infrastructure of the traditional store. We are much more agile and able to adapt based on what our customers need. So if they ask for a certain drug, we can almost immediately stock it up. We don't have to bring it out to 500 or 1,000 drugstores. I was going to do a time check, but never mind. Uh, we're actually not the first company to try doing an online pharmacy. This has been thought of and tried and attempted before, but we've probably gone further than most companies have. I think People ask me what my biggest challenge is, but the answer is my biggest challenge is also my biggest opportunity. A while ago you heard about people saying you have to think out of the box. I agree with that and I'll get to that later on, but it's also a fact that you have to think in the box 
when tackling a very complex, difficult problem like this. And what do I mean by in the box? We do this by identifying stakeholders who have something to gain by improving the system. The people who are in the drug industry, in the retail drug industry, whether manufacturers or regulators or drug stores themselves or payers, are not trying to make drugs inaccessible. They're not trying to make drugs expensive. It's just sort of the way the industry is structured. And what we're trying to do is disrupt it and restructure it. And the way we do this is by trying to create an ecosystem. I'm go going to go on a bit of a side here. Internally, we have a code word for this, which is let's bring our carabao to them, right? Let's bring our carabao to these people. And you're thinking, oh, what the hell is a carabao, right? What, what is this guy talking about? Let me refer to a story which, which guides a lot of what we do when trying to get people to join our mission. In a far-flung province in the Philippines, there was an old man who had 17 carabaos and 13, sorry, 17 carabaos and three sons. And he was dying, and his dying wish was that his carabaos would be equitably distributed among his three children. So 17 carabaos, three children. So his last dying wish was the eldest one gets one half, the second one gets one third, and the youngest one gets one ninth. Right? Are there any mathematicians or statisticians here? People who claim to work with big data? Never mind. So 17 carabaos, the oldest one gets one half, which is what number? I went into healthcare because I'm bad in math, so help me out here. 8.5, 8 right? 17 is 8.5. Um, 17 divided by 3 is a number I can't even fathom, but it's sort of 5 point something, something, something. You're rounding off, that's not fair. And the last one gets one ninth. So 17 divided by nine, again, is some random number. So it's very difficult. I don't know how many of you have tried eating carabao meat, but carabaos are meant to work, not to be chopped up and eaten. And they started fighting. And somebody on a carabao, an old wise man passes to them and sees, what's your problem? And they tell him, you know, we have 17 carabaos, we're dividing into one half, one, one third, and, and one ninth. So he says, oh, I see your problem. It's not that hard to solve because I have a carabao, so let me give it to you. So he gives them his carabao, and now they have 17 plus one. Very good, you have an A in math. Um, 18 carabao, so one half of 18 is? Now you can answer me, wow. Nine, one third of 18 is? Good, and one ninth of 18 is? Two. So nine plus six plus two, which is? Suddenly people are confused. Nine plus six plus two, 17. So there's sort of one carabao extra. So the old man gets back on it and goes away. How the hell did I do that? I don't know. I'm not the wise man. The point of the story is this. I'm not telling it to you just because it's cool, and it is. It's if a is business is viable, it can actually create value and give something to somebody without really losing much itself. And that's what we're trying to be. We're trying to be the person riding the carabao and giving something to each person in the ecosystem to enroll them in this mission. I've already told you how we're trying to serve customers better. Let me tell you how we're trying to serve companies better. Because a lot of drugs are actually paid for by companies, you know, through reimbursement. The BPO companies here probably know that, right? And the carabao we're giving them is lowering their health care costs. People who take drugs properly spend about 30% less in hospitalizations, doctor consultations, so on and so forth. So we're lowering their health care costs. We're also increasing the productivity of their employees. One of the BPO people told me the story where, you know, a lot of their people are sick very often and they go out and they have a one hour lunch break and they sadly have to spend 10 minutes going to the drugstore, 15 minutes waiting there, then 10 minutes getting back. So 35 minutes. And then they take their one hour lunch break because you know, it's like to eat, you know. So they're more productive that way. They're more productive uh, in terms of lower sick leaves and so on and so forth. So that's what we offer companies. Lower healthcare costs, more productive employees. 
the second uh, set of people we actually help are the pharma companies. I mentioned to you that we have everything electronic. We can track pretty much demographics, their mobile numbers, their age, where they live, what drugs they buy, when they buy it, what they buy it with, so on and so forth. It's an enormous amount of data, which is now not being recorded anywhere. We have all this data, and what this allows us to do is find out questions, or the answers to the questions which drug companies ask. What are the big emerging diseases? What's the purchasing behavior? What are they switching to? Which drugs are offered together with which? This is what we were offering manufacturers. This is beside the obvious secondary sales channel because they obviously know e-commerce for medicine is inevitable. In the US, 20% of drugs are actually delivered, not just bought in, in pharmacies. So that's the carabao that we give manufacturers. The, third big the fourth big player in this ecosystem is actually the regulators. And they have been the most vocal, in a good way, in terms of giving us feedback and advice on how to do this. But the carabao we give them is not just about making drugs more affordable and accessible to them, which is one of their main missions. The regulators also appreciate us for a few things. First of all, the Philippines is really hot or really wet. Is anyone going to say, no, it's not? I didn't think so. It's either really hot or really wet. It's, we ourselves have a hard time leaving our houses or offices, admit it, to buy drugs. But imagine people with disabilities, senior citizens having to do this. Imagine if you're sick. So we help that. Sometimes it's not just wet, it's really wet. When the typhoon comes, 80% of drugstores, 90% of drugstores, 99% in some areas, close down. We don't have to. We're centralized, we're protected. We can still deliver despite these typhoons. So that chain, people don't have to forego their medical drugs just because of, 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 of typhoons. And the last thing is, I don't know how many people here lived through SARS. Was anyone in Singapore, Hong Kong, or China during SARS? SARS was basically a pan. Oh, some people here. I know how old you are now. Uh, when SARS happened and there was a pandemic, people did not want and could not leave their homes, either because they didn't want to get sick or because they themselves were sick and they were a health risk to people. What we're allowing the drug retail industry to do is to operate even amidst this environment. So in the inevitable SARS or pandemic coming through, I don't know when it's going to come, 10 years, 20 years, but it's going to come. We have some infrastructure to make sure that the damage done is mitigated. So that's what I mean by thinking in the box, building that ecosystem, getting people enrolled in the mission and helping make this happen. We don't think of them as competitors, but as partners. The second thing is thinking outside of the box. What I was doing before this was food, restaurants, for about four years, and about 12 years, 12 years before that, I was doing technology. So with Bain & Company, I was in the technology practice. I was with Surpass, which is a tech company. What we've done is married these two disciplines into healthcare retail. So for example, for the food industry, we're very used to service, which I mentioned to you before. As simple as greeting people, getting customer feedback, reacting to it, knowing how people will react to certain changes in processes. The food industry is also very cutthroat. We don't sell 50 cents for 250. Oftentimes, food cost is 40, 50, and you sell it for 100. It's a much thinner margin. So from the food industry, we learned how to squeeze out as much cost as possible. Even how we pick drugs and all that is very similar to how people think about how to flip burgers. Except, you know, taking drugs from a shelf is actually easier. But you can really, really learn a lot from other industries. So whatever industry you are in, uh, I really encourage you, look outside and see what you can bring in. The second industry we're leveraging is technology, where information is in the bloodstream. So that allows us to design systems, design our IS, design our IT, 
to make sure that we capture the right information at the right time, store them in the right place where it's accessible, where people can do analytics on it, and use this to make things more efficient so we stock the right drugs, we do not stock the drugs that move, so on and so forth. So I was just told to hurry up. Um, let me go to the last slide because that's the last question. So let me take a, a minute and a half on this. People often ask me, you know, what made you abandon 1,000 employees and 50 restaurants? What made you abandon a high-level consulting job and, and surpass? And I, I, it's not a slide on profitability. It's not a slide on how big the industry is. It's, it's this slide. This is a slide I saw about four years ago, which triggered my midlife crisis. The Philippine life expectancy is 69 years old. In other comparable countries, it's about 75, 76 years old. There's a gap of those five years. I've lived in these countries, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam. I've lived there, I've worked them, and I swear to you, they also love to eat. The level of development is about the same. But they live much longer. And you have to believe a lot of this has to do with the healthcare system. The Philippine healthcare system is not very healthy, it's not very caring, and it sure as hell is not very systematic. This is the reason that we're trying to fix this. The biggest part of the healthcare system is actually pharmacy. It's 40% of the healthcare bar. And the biggest part of the health uh, pharmacy business is uh, in the delivery of these drugs. So by fixing this biggest parts, we're trying to close the gap between us and the other countries in this five-year time frame. One minute. Five-year time frame. We always say we're in a win-win situation. Either we win, we get big, we make drug prices go down, or other people copy us, drug prices go down, it becomes accessible. We're not trying to close down that five-year gap. We're just trying to close down even as little as one year by fixing this problem. You know, one year for 100 million Filipinos is 100 million years of life added to the Filipino nation. 100 million years of life added to Filipino people. And I think this is the reason why young graduates join our company instead of MNCs. This is the reason why the older people in the industry actually like our mission and help us disrupt this. It makes them feel young again. It's the reason why I wake up in the morning and fight this battle. Because if a million years of life isn't worth waking up or fighting for, I don't know what is. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and privilege to talk to you.